and go through some of those. Okay. So can we have a light down? And uh, so this was that uh, DC commutator model that we discussed. This was the first uh, practical so-called Gramme machine, which was a DC motor, which was utilized at the time in around 1870, which was uh, made. These are the original pictures from the Tesla basic patents of the rotating magnetic field. And in fact, when you compare this, on the right-hand side, you see this toroidal co coil, and you can see four coils on it, toroidal core and four coils. That's basically exactly what I have here. When you come down later, you'll see the toroid, you see four windings where he's creating a rotating field. And then in the center, he has a rotor, which is with the two sets of uh, windings or two poles to create a uh, rotating motion. And that's the basic patterns. In fact, it's some 30 patterns or so on a polyphase system. This is a, uh, one of the first uh, prototypes that were built at the time. It was a two-phase induction motor. What this is shown here, you see the box on the outside is really the big capacitor because uh, in some applications, you don't have a two-phase or three-phase system readily available. And, you want, and in fact, it, it is possible also to make a, uh, motors, induction motors run, run on a single phase. But uh, what you need to do for that is you need to get it started as a two-phase motor and eventually take the capacitor out. So what he has done here, this is one of the higher power single-phase motors with a capacitor start, so to speak. This is one typical industrial motor, which carries heavy horsepower. Here is uh, his, uh, one of his patents on uh, basically the power transmit three-phase generation, as you see on the right-hand side and uh, utilization, and in fact, uh, his uh, polyphase system of distribution as well. What is here, this is in Tesla Museum in Belgrade, a little uh, um, demonstration of how this polyphase system of transmission works. You have a turbine there and generating the power, and then you are well, actually, on the right-hand side, you have a turbine, you know, hydroelectric power plant, and you're generating the power. And then you have a high-voltage uh, high transformer on the right-hand side. Then you're bringing the voltage to the very high uh, voltage and low current, transmitting it over distance. Then with another transformer like that, you're bringing the voltage down, and then you're utilizing the motors and other uh, systems. So this is the whole concept is that what you know, was uh, done by him. Here is uh, one of the big installations. In fact, I think that this is one of the installations in uh, the Raven Niagara power plants. Let me see if there is one in the later. Well, one of the first, yeah, that's right. That's a Niagara power plant. And this here is a wooden structure for the transmission cables, which are carried high voltage transmission cables at the top. Of course, nowadays, you don't make it out of wood. But this was, uh, at the time, made, I think, about 100,000 volts and uh, transmitting uh, uh, megawatt power to Buffalo 20 miles away. This is a modern way of doing it, where you have the very high, uh, because the voltage is very high, and uh, you want to make sure that there is no sparking against the ground, so you have to put it very high up. So the higher the voltage, the higher the uh, cables. And of course, you have a three-phase cables carrying the, the power in the long distances. This here is uh, how the nuclear power plant in Yugoslavia is going to look like. Uh, Westinghouse, I think, is building it. And that is. Uh, generating some 600 megawatts of power. And of course, the whole co conversion into electricity and transmission is a polyphase system and Tesla system of work. OK, now we go. Here, this is a description of the, what I mentioned to you about this uh, generator with many poles, which was capable of creating uh, 30 kilohertz or so of frequency. That's his high frequency work. So I have a few view graphs. This is basically a schematic of the Tesla coil. Then you have a spark gap. You have a capacitor on the primary side. And then uh, you have an oscillator circuit on the primary side. And there is oscillator circuit on the secondary because the capacitance, intervening capacitor on the secondary side is uh, sort of implied. It's a part of the circuit, basically. And the wavelengths of the emitted waveforms depends on basically this uh, LC uh, frequency, resonant frequency. Here is a big Tesla coil in operation in his laboratory, one of the, the bigger ones that he made. This is my uh, famous photo that I uh, always use at the front of our course, course brochures. This is Tesla sitting up in front. Now, if you think that this is, a, this is not as scary, actually, because there were many, uh, fewer traces. This was done by a trick photography. So there were a number of uh, uh, shots done uh, over the period of uh, one minute. And they're all overlaid, you see. 
there are not as many streaks in, a, in one at one in any given time. So uh, here is uh, his experiments uh, with the fluorescent light bulbs. I think. Yeah, and that's uh, uh, his fluorescent light bulb. In fact, I didn't even mention. We'll have a later one view graph. He also experimented with the X-rays. Uh, about the time when Rengen was coming up with the X-rays. Okay, here is a prototype that he actually used of this radio control boat. This is a boat, and this is how it looked from top and how it looked on the side with the rudder. And it had the transmitter and receiving stations, and that's what he demonstrated in uh, New York in Madison Square Garden. And this is another picture of the same uh, boat. This is one of the pictures that Tesla actually took uh, using when he was experimenting with his x rays. This is a picture of another of his inventions, which is a vertical takeoff and landing aircraft, which would sort of change. I don't have it, uh, I have it on a videotape, but uh, basically this would work, and then uh, the aircraft would sort of uh, start vertically, and then it would, in uh, operation when it was vertical, it would change its direction and then continue horizontally, so it would likely make a square. And uh, present day Air Force. Pogo aircraft is actually doing exactly that. Well, here's a Edison medal, the plaque that he got. That was in 1917. Then uh, I think what I also is uh, kind of sad because he uh, lacked the funds and uh, Westinghouse and uh, later, of course, uh, what happens with the patents? I didn't finish that story. When uh, Westinghouse bought the patents, then of course, since uh, Edison Electric Company was much stronger financially and couldn't stand the competition, at one point in time, they actually had to give a uh, patents at a wholesale price to Edison Electric Company, which was then actually already became a General Electric Company. So you see, the post General Electric then, of course, uh, put all its might into commercializing it and uh, making it uh, used on a worldwide basis. So. Both of them uh, property. Here is uh, Tesla, of course, got the many uh, honorary doctorate degrees. And uh, you know, many of the schools in Europe and many in the United States rushed to give him honorary degree. So he did get some recognition to that. But the biggest recognition he got is the, that the unit of the magnetic flux density in an international system of units is named Tesla after him. Of course, that came many, many years after his death. He died in 1943, January 7. And it was in 1955 at the meeting of the Electro uh, Electrotechnical Committee on Measures, in, which happened to be in Dubrovnik, Yugoslavia, mm -hmm. that it was decided that the unit for a flux density be named Tesla. Now, this is very important uh, uh, physical quantity, because in the magnetism, in the magnetic work, one of the most important quantities is a saturation flux density of magnetic materials. For example, ferrite, typical one that's utilized in high frequencies, has a flux density of uh, 0.4 Tesla. But there are others like uh, uh, silicon steel and others which are utilized at 20 kilohertz or lower frequencies, which are having a 1.6 Tesla. And directly related to the magnitude of the flux saturation density is related to the size of a magne uh, size of magnetic device. In other words, if you have a higher flux density material, you can make more compact and smaller magnetic device, whether it's a transformer, whether it's a motor, whatever magnetic device you're making, electromagnet, etc. So this is one of the key properties, basically. Here is uh, Tesla's uh, million volt transmitter. He made a 100 million volt transmitter. He is uh, reported to make a, uh, to made a Tesla coil that he was able to generate a voltage of 100 uh, million volts. This is a Tesla at age 77 in 1933. Uh, it was uh, at that time that uh, many uh, scholars and scientists wrote uh, letters to Tesla in support in celebrating his 77 years. In fact, they were invited. Among them was also Millikan, famous physicist from Caltech, uh, who also wrote him a letter in commemorating. Because most of these physicists used as in their experiments, I mean, working with a high voltage, they needed a high voltage source. They used the Tesla coil, actually, and before Van de Graaff uh, oscillator became available. So. 
they recognized his contributions uh, at that time, but unfortunately, it was uh, from 1933 till 1943, for the last 10 years of his life, Tesla didn't have any funds. He was 77 years old at the time in 1933, and he was uh, then supported for the last 10 years of his life by $500 stipend from uh, then Yugoslav government. So this is kind of a, where it really uh, is sad, and I think uh, part of the problem and why he's a forgotten genius may be that perhaps uh, both General Electric and Westinghouse felt that uh, he didn't get a fair share, and they don't want to really uh, publicize that. So the whole thing is uh, uh, kind of hidden. In fact, uh, I was amazed to see that in this conference on uh, Colorado Springs honoring 100 years of Tesla's coming to the United States, there was not a single paper or single uh, presentations made either from General Electric or Westinghouse. <laughs> and this is a man, man who made it happen. And uh, he died in 1943 all alone. Basically, the last few years of his life he spent uh, feeding the pigeons in uh, New York, and he lived in uh, Waldorf Astoria Hotel in some 40-plus uh, 40, 40 uh, uh, story hotel room. And was uh, his remains and all what he writings. In fact, you, would, you wouldn't believe that he left behind him some 100,000 pieces of writings, technical writings and letters, and all of that was transferred back to Yugoslavia and it is stored in the uh, Nikola Tesla Museum in Belgium. In fact, most of these uh, slides I obtained uh, from the museum uh, when I was visiting several years ago. So the, that's the, I think the, the hard part also to understand is why Tesla, and I, I am puzzled myself, I'm trying to explain the phenomenon, why the man who made such a tremendous contributions, okay, if he was forgotten while he was alive, which is usually what happens to the scientists, which are of a great uh, uh, stature, why usually the history has a tendency to rectify injustice done to the, and everyone gets his right place eventually in, uh, in uh, history books. But if you find out, even the polyphase system, even induction motor, I teach the courses in motors and generators. One of the courses I teach is power electronics, but one is uh, motors and generators at Caltech. And you go through 200 books, textbooks in this field, you will not find a single one which mentions that the induction motor is a Tesla invention. And every other inventor is always credited with what he has done. Why did that happen? Well, part of the story is this General, uh, General Electric, Westinghouse, and their, if you will, uh, unwillingness to really say what and how it really happened and why he got to such a a bad cut out of the whole situation. But the other part is that there are a lot of people because he, it's, he was a man with a, such a tremendous inventive genius that a lot of people started, uh, there are a lot of uh, pseudoscientists, uh, a lot of other people who started claiming things which are impossible, perpetual mobile machine for example, and uh, they jumped on a bandwagon claiming that this is uh, something that they are following on the work of Tesla. So he got a bad reputation because a lot of these uh, pseudoscientists jumped on that bandwagon. In fact, I, at the Colorado Spring Conference, I was uh, horrified to see. I was witnessing there for two days. The people were coming on the stage and demonstrating how uh, asking someone from the audience to look at the meters and to uh, actually prove the fact that their systems, which had some short circuit someplace, I'm sure, creates more power on the output than they put in, you know. And uh, <laughs> you couldn't even go to contest that because they wouldn't understand, they wouldn't let you. And uh, then you see what the media does. I was convinced that New York, si New York Times, which is a very reputable magazine, has a special section on the science every, every week. In, in their section on it, they reported on a conference. And conference all was, conference was all about uh, pseudoscientists, about this perpetual mobile machines, and uh, they reported, and then there is a big article with the Tesla's picture saying, Nikola Tesla is finally vindicated. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that story even propagated further because then I was getting my weekly magazine from Yugoslavia, and that weekly magazine carried the article of the same structure because it was simply recopied from the New York Times. So you can see how the, basically the distorted news becomes propagated and, and goes on. Okay, I think uh, I took uh, enough time and uh, I'd like to first uh, thank uh, the organizers of this uh, talk. I always enjoy, as I said, you know, I'm always willing, next time give me two hours, I'll come, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I would like to show some, just uh, before we finish, uh, if the videotape is ready, let's uh, show the videotape. It's only three minutes and uh, then uh, uh, before you leave, I have,